So hello today for this uh, webinar uh, with amazing speakers who know a lot about APIs for governments for actually a webinar on uh, uh, two recent papers that have been out recently. Uh, and that will try to answer the question, APIs for governments, why, how, and what? Uh, so this webinar is provided with you as a partnership with uh, three uh, members, APIScene.io, API Days, and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So first, the first partner is API Days Conferences. It's the main series of conferences about APIs, uh, right? That organize events uh, worldwide, and that will represent the community here uh, 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 for, for this webinar. And that I, as the founder and chairman, I will, I will represent. This is also a partnership with the API scene.io platform. It's the, it's the platform about uh, uh, API ar articles, about APIs, news about the API industry that is, uh, 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 let's say, influencer-driven uh, and influencer-generated. Uh, and that will help also to spread up this, uh, this webinar and the content about APIs for governments. And uh, the, our last partner will be actually the, uh, the, the speakers here. It's a, it's a mix of analysts and the Joint Research Center of, of the European Commission. And who will tell us uh, uh, some, uh, a sum up of, let's say, the last two reports that they published. Uh, the first one is application programming interface in governments, why, what, and how. And the second one is an application programming interface framework for digital governments. And we will try to have uh, some knowledge and content from them. And here are our three co-authors and co-speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Monica Posada, who is a digital economy research fellow at this joint research center of the European Commission. We have uh, Mark Boyd, the founder of Platformable, uh, and also API writer and analyst who wrote many, many uh, uh, reports about the API industry. And we have also, also Lorenzino Akari, who is the former senior researcher at the Joint Research Center and now external consultant uh, about uh, APIs for governments. So Monica, Mark, and Lorenzino, you are in the call. How are you today? Great. How are you? <laughs> Great. Hey, Mark? Frank, great to be here with you all. Yeah, so very good. good. Thanks a lot, Mekri, for the introduction and uh, giving us this possibility. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, accepting to do this uh, joint webinar with us. We think uh, governments and public sector has, has done a lot of the last years, but APIs can help uh, definitely a lot. And you are the best uh, thought leaders in the space. And what you published actually is really respected. And which we will try in the next 45 minutes to tell a little bit of all the knowledge that is accumulated into these. So in the next 45 minutes, uh, uh, Monica, Mark, and Lorenzino will, will, will share with us all their a piece of their knowledge on the topic. And we will tr just try to answer these different questions like why APIs for governments? Why it's a, it's a, it's a strategy that makes sense? Why, how they can be useful? We will also talk about what is the current government API landscape and understanding uh, uh, what's, what's about in the industry. What's the potential of APIs for governments and public sector? You know, the way we have open data policies, but what APIs brings to the game? Uh, what is the cultural challenge of APIs for governments? You know, even if the business leaders took a lot of time to adapt an API culture, how long it will take for governments? What governments needs to adapt this API culture? We will also discover how to think the people, the process, the platform, and the policies of, uh, of APIs for, uh, for public sector. Uh, and last two question, how to align government open data and transparency strategies with APIs? You know, a lot of policies that in the last 10 years, how APIs are a game changer. The last one, but not least, we will discover what is the API framework for governments and public sector, you know, on the technical side, cultural side, policy side, process side. We will discover that, that all together. And for that, I'm really glad to have our first uh, speaker, uh, Monica who will tell us uh, a little bit, uh, a nice introduction about the topic. I invite you to share your, your screen, uh, right? And, uh, and yes, and share all your content for all our, all our attendees. So thanks, thanks a lot, Mekdi. It's, it's um, a real pleasure to, to be broadcasting the result of our research um, that, uh, that have lasted uh, already for two years. And it's only um, the beginning because we have understood that, that APIs um, are actually uh, the, the, the connective tissue of the digital era. And that um, as uh, composable pieces of the software that 
uh, of software that enable the integration of uh, system and actors in increasingly uh, complex digital environments. Um, APIs are, are indeed the foundational uh, enablers of the digital transformation of, of the society. Um, governments are indeed non, uh, not an exception of, on, on, on this. Um, they are expected to, to keep the pace with this transformation. And uh, in particular, uh, citizens, business, and other societal actors um, uh, expect to have means to, to connect uh, and interact digitally with governments in seamless uh, processes. Um, in this sense, our study concludes that um, APIs are indeed enablers of this uh, digital transformation of governments and uh, that the reason behind it is uh, the high flexibility that APIs provide to digital infrastructures. Um, the, the point is uh, the policy relevance of APIs, uh, when we think about it in the context of, of um, Europe current um, uh, priorities, um, in, in, in specifically uh, a Europe fit for the digital age, um, is linked to, uh, to the capacity that the APIs have uh, to provide uh, flexible access to digital assets and uh, also to, to its connective role among different actors and systems. Um, in, this, in this sense, uh, API infrastructure can support policy design, implementation and monitoring. Um, APIs are modular easily to scale and easily uh, monitor in terms of performance and behavior. Um, and this information can indeed be um, useful to improve the government processes and operations, to assess potential threats and support the development of mitigation measures, and to identify um, key partners, both internal and external, and to build up um, innovative digital solutions. Um, for giving you examples on how API currently feature in policy making, I can mention the, the explicit and implicit uh, mention of APIs in regulations such as the um, payment um, PSD2 regulation and the private uh, and the public sector information and open data uh, regulation that explicitly mention uh, the APIs as a uh, means to provide access to high value data sets and dynamic data. So um, these are indeed uh, examples of policy implementations, but still uh, APIs will also play a role in the policy design, for instance, on how to make, um, how to ensure that the, the, um, the uptake of AI is, is massive and uh, to bring Europe to, to be a, a, technolo a, a technological leader and to have um, technology um, sovereignty and indeed data sovereignty and indeed. Uh, this is also, um, there is also, um, the, the, the APIs will also play a role on um, how to, to materialize uh, the GDPR um, uh, implementation of data portability. That is also one regulation that is uh, currently ongoing. Um, so uh, this more or less um, justifies the, um, the why um, APIs, I mean, why, why there is currently uh, an eye um, in, in uh, so policies looking at the relevance of APIs for, for the, um, for digital government. Um, we did a, a, a very, very long study um, and uh, we, we observed um, a lot of uh, use cases and um, extensive literature of uh, best practice of the private and public sector. And uh, we, we, um, we found uh, lots of evidences of the benefits and the opportunities that the adoption of API of, in governments bring. For instance, we, we observed that indeed they, there was an improving, an improving of uh, the access to public sector data. Um, there was uh, um, uh, APIs um, foster innovation. So uh, they, they act as a, catal as a catalyzer of, of the innovation. So um, they fa facilitate adaptive uh, evolution of, of legacy systems. 
and uh, facilitate the design test and 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 and, 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 and implementation on new public services. We observe also efficiency gains, um, the reduction of such as the reduction of cost, the the improve of processes and and uh, in in and and the the the, the specific the, the the development on new public uh, services adapted to to a larger um, um, a very targeted to 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 different um, uh, citizen needs. Uh, we also found um, uh, the enhance the of, of reporting flows in government procedures. So uh, the fact that um, APIs are so flexible and uh, it's a very easy way to, to get uh, data when needed and, and, um, and for, for what is needed. We, um, and, and the main um, conclusion that we ar uh, arrive is that actually uh, the APIs are at the core of the creation of digital ecosystems due to its connective role. Um, also, we, we, we found opportunities like economic opportunities, uh, even, even uh, around the, um, the provision of APIs uh, from the government. We, we saw that there were um, certain firms that managed to, to, to reduce the cost on, on uh, getting in, uh, in contact with governments um, and, and in running their businesses. We also found um, evidences that uh, certain uh, partners around uh, the government were able to yield profits on the use of public sector information. Um, we also uh, saw that there was uh, a triggering on innovative uh, financing mechanisms, such as uh, uh, co-finding co -finding, um, opportunities and uh, co-payment uh, models on on um, on this on the service provision. Uh, but all, all, it's not only um, positives. Uh, indeed, um, governments need to, to, to have in mind that uh, in order to, to seize the, the whole opportunity that APIs uh, can, can bring them, they need to, to, to think an investment. So they need to think about um, their uh, government platform vision and to, to, to invest on ensuring that, uh, that uh, there is uh, interoperability between all the, all the services that are created. Otherwise, um, they will not be capable of, of uh, getting um, all the benefits uh, that are lying there. Uh, they will need to think how to re-engineer the systems toward an API-enabled infrastructure. And um, more, most of all, they will have to have a, a cultural change um, uh, and also to invest on the on the on the um, upskilling of, of civil servants. Um, regarding the challenges, uh, the biggest one that we've understood is the vulnerability. Indeed, APIs are doors to um, to um, ICT infrastructures that need to be sealed, that need to be protected. And um, otherwise, the resilience of, of um, entire organizations um, depends on the robustness of, the, of, of their uh, API infrastructure. And as such, that uh, reflects on cost uh, and so on. So um, after having analyzed uh, all these, um, all the material uh, that, that we um, observed, uh, what we, what the three main con, um, conclusions that we arrive is that indeed APIs have been long present in, in government infrastructures, but their um, adoption is uneven and um, very, very often not optimally uh, coordinated. Uh, this means that um, it's, it's very typically uh, siloed and um, they are missing the opportunity to cross fertilize between uh, different um, departments and uh, most of all with external partners as well. Uh, we observed that uh, the, AP, the current APIs strategies in the governments are mostly covering operational and tactical aspects, but only in a few cases, they are already um, developing an, a, a digital ecosystem vision which is the one that um, we, we, we believe it will bring uh, the, the most benefits of all. Um, we observed that, yeah, 
and I will um, directly jump to to the main uh, the main part of this uh, of this webinar, which is the uh, the how. So after uh, um, scru scrutinizing all this material, um, we found uh, we 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 uh, proposed uh, a framework for a cohesive cohesive API adoption in government environments. Um, so uh, from the analysis. We structure the actions to be taken by organization to better profit of their API infrastructure. Um, this proposal distills from the analysis of ex extensive literature about API adoption uh, practices in organizations. And, um, and um, we, we uh, our, our, um, our uh, consultant, um, Mark Boyd, Will um, drive through um, how how to how to use um, um, our our proposals in order to 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 better benefit of uh, the API infrastructure in in governments. So I give the floor to uh, yeah. Wonderful, thank you, Monica. Uh, that's fantastic. So now let's get into the uh, the uh, the API framework, as um, Monica explained. I'm just getting my screen sharing ready. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so it's been it's been a real pleasure to be able to work with Monica and Lorenzino and their team at the Joint Research Centre uh, on this uh, work. So uh, just recapping, as Monica said, it came from very much from having a literature review where we uh, identified three hundred and fifty odd. Um, articles uh, from governments around the world and from industry that really talked about best practices as far as how to implement APIs. We then, out of 343 documents rather, so then out of that collection, we then saw which ones were the key documents from governments that really demonstrate how to pull all of this together. So in some of Monica's slides, for example, she showed us the uh, the France example, which is one of the highlights. I think we've got some great examples from Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and then globally from the US, from uh, Canada, from uh, Victoria in Australia, some really great models all around the world. Singapore, we can learn a lot from. Um, and then out of that, we identified what where the best practices are, what the gaps are. And as Monica's already alluded, one of the biggest gaps is around um, the lack of that digital ecosystem um, approach. So everything goes up as far as um, it's done for a particular area. So governments might build APIs for transport or for weather or something like that. Um, but then there's not really a consideration of how you then use it in more of an ecosystem approach to be able to be encouraging um, the sort of wider policy goals around uh, climate impacts, around uh, transport, and mobility of um, populations, that sort of thing. Anyway, so out of our research, we identified those gaps. Um, we've, we found the shortlist, the distillation of the um, best practices. And then out of that, we then created the framework. So the framework includes 12 API proposals, which we'll walk through in a minute. We then used, thanks to API days uh, last year, we actually held a number of workshops around Europe. So in Helsinki, um, Barcelona and in Paris, we held workshops to show the work we'd been doing on the API proposals and we validated the, that framework. And then out of that, we also then did a project with the Lombardy region in Italy to be able to pilot some self-assessment maturity tools. So out of the framework, we have then got a series of checklists. So any government can actually look at the 12 proposals in the framework and measure where they are and what they need to work on next. So just quickly, uh, the, let's first of all look at what the government API approaches are. So the way we saw it is that there's four key ways that governments are using APIs. So one, uh, what, the one we're most, com uh, we're most, we're most uh, familiar with, I would imagine, is data APIs. And that's where APIs are used to expose data in real time 
in an integratable machine readable form so that they can be automatically plugged into systems. And again, with the uh, weather and mobility examples, this means that real time weather can be put into uh, an app that then a uh, that then a weather app that, um, is using that real time data on the weather direct from the weather stations or uh, we can design route planners which help people move from A to B using public transport APIs that again tell pardon me you're updated in real time to then say where you know when the next bus is coming. Uh, within government actually there's a whole ton of these that we don't even know or see which is really as, as Monica was saying about the um, the efficiencies within government, there's all these government departments that are sharing data across government departments. At the moment, that's um, that value is locked away in Excel or in um, spreadsheets. And then is there is challenges in, do I have the latest version of the spreadsheet? Is this cor the correct data? Has it been cleaned and is it being shared appropriately as far as the certain people shouldn't have access to certain elements of that data set? You know, it can be a real mess. And so if it's by API, it removes all of that duplication, um, the inefficiencies, the worries about um, exposing data that certain people shouldn't have um, and so forth. The second area is that, so that's one area where governments can use APIs in data, in the data circle. A second area is in the sharing of the services. So all government departments, as they move to a digital government infrastructure, most government departments will need to be able to check your identification when you're um, signing up for a service online. It might be as simple as like a, a library card. So then, but you still need to show some something to verify your identity. So you go to that uh, website, the government website, and you f go to fill in your library card, and you need to you need to be able to um, uh, confirm who you are. You go to another area which might be about um, registering for childcare, and again, you need to be able to put in your. Uh, your, your identity details. Uh, for the tax service, you might need to be able to put in your details there and to be able to check how your uh, tax refund is going. There, what could happen or what is currently happening in digital government around the world is the tax department is building that identification tool to be able to, for you to sign on. The library is building their own identification for you to sign on. Um, the childcare office is as well. So in each one of those, then they're rebuilding these common um, elements. And as Monica was saying, it's about the reusable, uh, reusable components that are being built for digital government. So when government moves to an API approach, they build that identity verification once and all government services use that API. Uh, Monica also talked about the growing use of artificial intelligence and machine learning within government and within other circles. Going back to that transport example, the, uh, that's a lot of information that's been funneled by the API. So if you wanted to look at uh, whether or not you can predict whether or not um, the buses are going to run on time today when it's raining, or whether there's going, whether they should be sending out alerts to let know people know that um, traditionally on um, uh, on wet days the buses run five minutes late or something like that. You can start building up all of these sorts of data models by using um, APIs as a pipeline that's pulling in all of this sensor data. We already see this in some cities, for example, where they're optimizing their waste management. Uh, collections by actually going around and deciding on a day by day basis when where to collect the rubbish bins, the the um, street rubbish bins from based on um, sensors that show how much uh, rubbish is in those bins and then whether or not it needs to be collected. So you can see then it's a pipeline that's been developed. Um, for the, and then we can run uh, machine learning algorithms on top of that pipeline to be able to optimize uh, use of resources and be more sustainable with our cities. And then off to the side a little bit, um, you can see that API, governments have a role with APIs in setting regulatory standards. So when governments are enforcing that APIs be used by an industry sector in a common way, 
to agreed standards in order to open up competition, to be able to um, ensure that the um, uh, standards of privacy and um, uh, security are upheld. Often the government will set those APIs, uh, will set API standards for that industry that everyone in that industry must follow. So we see this in Europe, um, for example, with the uh, use of the Second Payment Services Directive APIs, which are from um, governments that say that there is a particular way that um, banks must expose uh, information um, where the customer has given consent for payments or for using sharing their account transaction data with different apps. And there are some standards being developed around that. We also see it around electronic health records where for government, uh, where governments are insisting the use of regulatory standards for APIs in order to be able to ensure that um, a, that health records can be shared between one health professional and the next, where the consumer or where the citizen gives the right for that consent to happen, um, that they share that across um, the borders as well. So there's, as uh, Monica described, there's a whole range of value that's then generated out of those government APIs. So I won't go into this. We've already heard about resource optimization. You can do research, you can innovate, you can, man uh, you can automate manual tasks, and then you can look at your data for insights and, uh, and opportunities to optimize your processes. How governments make APIs available is, so if we look in the center, at the moment, what's happening is the each department is then exposing those APIs. So we've got on the right hand side, you've got APIs that are being decided because of um, budget and resources that this is the best way to expose information. So uh, the, the example I gave of an internal um, system where two departments need to share data, that may be done Best, they, it may be decided that the best way for those departments to share that data is via an API. So it's a sort of budget and resource an issue. There may be the APIs as far as the, um, uh, the mobility or the weather, where it's decided that's how you're going to share the APIs. Or it could be, um, again, because you want to make sure that everyone is using just the single source of truth for an API data set, like a registry of um, uh, schools, that might be for all of the city or for all of the country. And you wanna make sure that the one set of schools data is updated and maintained in the one place rather than each department developing up their own use of, um, uh, of, uh, of data sets around that. So then as that happens, then each of the departments will take a responsibility for owning that API. And then that might be shared internally to government or then on the left-hand side, it might be actually shared openly with industry, with researchers, with community groups. So thinking about all of these uh, aspects, we had to put all of this together into the API framework for digital government. Now, when we did this, and here's the link you can get, get to to be able to read the framework or download it, um, the, one of the things that we had to factor into it was the fact that all of the governments are already building APIs. So as Monica showed, they're doing this at, at like an individual level where the APIs are operational, or they're doing it at a tactical level where it's for the department. But we're, when we say that, that we're, in, we're encouraging an API framework for digital government, we need to accept that that work is already ongoing. So it can't be a matter of like telling everyone to stop and then change this new system. It's got to be a maturing process where you can continue with your government APIs while also course correcting so that they're more cohesive and that they're connected up into, into providing the ecosystem benefits. So when we're looking at the framework, we had to look at who's going to be able to get a value out of our framework. And we saw four particular user personas that we wanted to write for. There's the policy lead that's already writing policies. So for example, the Green Deal, um, they'll be writing an interoperability policy. They'll be writing the data strategy, um, the artificial intelligence, whatever. And they need to, they, so they ask themselves, I need to see that APIs are helping generate the intended policy impacts without creating any undue negative impacts. So they're gonna be able to wanna to look at elements of the framework that are going to help them measure whether or not their policy is being implemented. 
you've got the department implementer, for example, a digital government lead. They need to be able to allocate resources, which can be budget, people and time, to manage API activities cohesively. So they're the ones who are gonna do that course correction, correcting. Then you've got a product manager, for example, the, the person in charge of all of the mobility APIs for a government, or perhaps they're just in charge of one, like a weather API. And they need to be ensuring that they're using best practices to manage government APIs for the longer term and to report on their impacts. And then you've got the API developer who day by day is actually building the APIs, making sure they run, making sure that they're performant and that they're returning the API calls um, in a quick way and that they're easy to consume. So we wanted a framework that was going to be relevant and useful to all of those four audiences. And I hope that um, in this webinar, the people um, listening in, I hope you can see where you would sit within one of these personas. Now, here's our framework for digital government. So we looked at um, the strategy, which is the whole of government level, and that's that sort of policy setting environment. Then we looked at the tactical level, which is the um, departmental level. And then we looked at the operational level. And we also looked at four different pillars. I'm going to describe all of this for you now. So at the API strategy level, the goal here is about fact finding. It's not about defining. Our, API, APIs as they as it is, APIs are the tail wagging the dog often enough. So we and we found this in the in in this case as well. So for example, when they were building APIs within some governments, they wanted to chunk it down and work with external consultants. So they were able to build out new projects that hired external consultants quickly to work on one set of APIs. And in doing so, that meant that they were changing the procurement policies of the government. So you can see how um, API actions might actually influence you know, um, overall government policies. That happens quite a bit, but we're trying to actually turn that around and acknowledge that governments have a strategy level that are, is setting the policies. So here at this level, what we're doing with the API strategy is collecting all of those resources. So we're looking for what are the policies that might be relevant, the digital relevant. So for example, the digital government policy or the Green Deal policy. Um, we're looking at what is government's vision around having a platform um, approach or an ecosystem approach. Some governments have it where it's more about sharing information internally across government departments. Others want to work with external providers as well in more of an open ecosystem. So understanding where that is, understanding what your current governance structures are, understanding what your um, uh, your principles are. That so a lot of governments have digital government principles. You know, user centered design. Uh, ask for information only once and we'll use it in multiple places, you know, things like that. So getting all of that together. So it's determined by the policy lead, but it's understood by the digital government lead in this case. So second of all, we've got the tactical level. So this is where it's directed by the digital government lead, but then um, managed by a series of product, pro, uh, product managers. And this is about planning and allocating resources appropriately um, at the um, de department level, but it could also be the whole of government level where you've got something like a cross-cutting uh, uh, agency, like a digital government agency that's working with a range of different government um, departments. And they're about allocating resources, so it's about setting priorities. You can't do everything every, you know, all at once every year. Uh, and this sort of course correction means that you need to be able to decide which is really important, um, but it does help you avoid the duplication of API activities. And then at an operational level, you might have the product manager who's in charge of the API, but they're working alongside the actual developer team that's actually building and designing the APIs and making sure that they run on a day-by-day basis. So they're about trying to use the best practices to guide their work. So they're the three um, uh, levels, if you like, strategy, tactics, and operations. But we also have four pillars. So the policy pillar is about ensuring that APIs always align and serve a policy process, uh, a purpose. So at a strategic level, it's just about knowing how the API is going to um, support that policy goal. Uh, at the tactical level, it's about making sure that it's prioritized um, in the right 
uh, way with the policy uh, with the broader policy goals, um, and then are they um, uh, an operational level that you're collecting data to be able to share back to show that there is um, that you are actually um, uh, using APIs as a um, uh, enabling technology as, as Monica described. Second of all is the platform and ecosystems pillar. And here it's about building the right components that are reusable that will make APIs work successfully. So at a strategic level, it's understanding whether or not these are going to be for internal or for external um, use um, and who's around the table. Um, to make those decisions. It's about making sure you're lo looking at developing shared services. And then at the operational level, it's about actually building each of those components. Um, the people, this gets to the culture question that uh, Mehdi raised as well. And it's about recognizing the need for skills and structure as far as um, supporting people to have cross competency teams to be able to run API. So at the, at the strategic level, it's about having the governance structure. At the tactical level, it's about having um, technical and policy people working together. And then at the um, API operational level, it's about having a product management approach. And then finally, um, under the processes, it's about implementing API activities using best practices. So at a strategic level, it's about having guiding principles that guide your um, work. At the tactical level, it's about following a product management approach. And then at an operational level, it's about using life cycle um, best practices. So when we look then at the framework, which, which so you can download, of, there's the, uh, where is it? Boom, there's the link. I'll give it to you again at the end as well. Um, the, um, what you can do or the way we've structured the framework is that you go through and each proposal, there's 12 of those as you can see here. And then for each one, we describe it briefly. We talk about the strength of the evidence that's based around it. And we talk about some of the issues that you need to consider as a government when you're implementing that proposal. So this is again about not trying to take you off from the work that you're currently doing, but helping you just move your work so it matches up and is more cohesive across government. To help you along with that, we've then included a self-assessment checklist to help you measure where you are at. So you're able to sort of see where maybe you've got particular gaps that you might be able to um, address in this year's work if, you, if that's a priority area for you. Uh, and then we also highlight some of the best practices and some of the leading governments around the world from our literature review where you might want to look at how they did it and then be able to copy what they did or learn from their um, approaches. So really what we see is that there's a sort of virtuous cycle that comes out of um, using this API framework. So you read the framework guideline for a particular proposal. So for example, maybe you're working on governance. So you'd read the governance um, proposal. You then can have a look at the best practice literature that's suggested in that and some of the implementation um, considerations. You would work your way through the self-assessment checklist. Um, then out of that, if you use the online, uh, if you use the mobile version of that self-assessment checklist, you get some feedback and you can share that with your team. If it's, a nest, if it's a priority area for you for this year, you can decide how you're going to uh, implement that change. Then you can measure your impacts and then you're back to um, doing the next framework proposal or, you know, whichever one out of the 12 is most relevant for your work. Uh, and then also with this, we're saying that overall, when we're trying to elevate this to be an ecosystem approach rather than just a technical concern, then the issue is that there's a disconnect at the moment. And we see this in business as well, where there's a disconnect between um, the value from an, that's being generated from the APIs and how that is communicated back to the government more widely. So there is a point in API delivery, as most of us will be familiar with, where it suddenly becomes a technical concern. And then it's just about having the API and running the API to make sure that it works functioning every day. But we need to bring that back to being a, um, being recognized as a policy enabling technology. And we do that by measuring the impact. So the policy teams set the priorities within government. The digital government 
Um, leader is then saying, okay, APIs will help you achieve that policy goal. I'm going to allocate the right resources to be able to do that. Um, the product manager um, will then be setting up the measurement systems to be able to ensure that you're able to um, measure that the APIs are helping with that policy goal. And then the developer will be help um, actually build the right systems and the technical um, uh, metrics approaches so that you're able to track and monitor that. So for example, at the um, whole of government level, maybe you've got um, under the Green Deal that you wanna be encouraging uh, more use of public transport in order to be able to reduce CO2 emissions. And so the digital government leader might say, okay, we would do that with APIs because if people can use APIs for the route planning, they're going to be able to drive directly to their parking um, spot um, uh, and then catch public transport the rest of the way. And so they're going to reduce CO2 emissions that way because people will have trust in the system. So then the product manager will need to be setting up measurement systems that, not, that aren't just about how many API calls are made through the route travel planning app, but, but also there's research available on how much route using route travel planners reduces CO2 emissions. So you would actually look at how much you could have as a weighting for, um, gut, for public transport APIs. When they're used in route transport, there might be like 20% of that um, uh, 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 of CO2 emissions can be tracked back to the use of um, uh, route travel planners. Uh, so the... Um, uh, so, so you could set up those sorts of metrics and be using those available weighting. And if there isn't that available weighting, then the product manager speaks with the digital government leader. And maybe in the first year, you have to actually do some research on measuring what that potential impact or how much the API can uh, influence the wider policy goal. Um, and then maybe that's the first year of uh, project work priority setting that you do there. And then the developer can build that and then the reports from the developer come back to the product manager, the digital government, and then also to the policy lead to show what impact the API is having on the policy goal. Um, so just to finish, the, we've got an example of how this works with um, the Lombardy region in Italy. So they have a three-year strategic um, goals around how all of government is going to operate. And so they've then their IT department, ARIA, uh, or their authority that's involved with digital government oversight, then goes through that strategic, uh, the strategic plan and identifies all of the areas where APIs could play a role in helping um, uh, implement the, the policy goals for the government. Then that ARIA area, which is like the um, uh, digital government lead, if you like, they, um, they've identified that, they identify what stakeholders would be involved from based on their ecosystem uh, model. Um, they identify, um, they then start allocating the resources that are needed. That they work with individual product managers to be able to set up um, ecosystem relationships where they get the, the, all of the members of their ecosystem together to be able to set priorities. They build the right metric systems. Um, they ensure that um, governance is in place and they then start building out the platform components. And then the developers within each uh, a pro a project area or product area then starts building the APIs to make sure that um, it meets those policy needs, pardon me, but also that the, um, metrics is being collected to be able to help feed it back so that you're able to tell where the APIs are generating the value. So all up, that's the framework and an example there of how it's run. These two links, the first link here gives you straight to go into the framework with the 12 proposals. And the second link gives you access to a mobile and online app that helps you walk through the different um, maturity checklist that you can, um, uh, that you can uh, use to be able to um, see where you're at and then be able to identify where you wanna to go to next. So that's all up. If you wanna get in touch as well, um, there's my email um, to be able to uh, chat with me. I could talk about this sort of stuff all day. Thanks a lot. So Lorenzino, as a co-author, as a 
uh, um, someone who has been in the space on, on research and EPIs and digital governments and knowing Mark and Monica also, uh, what, what could be a good wrap, a good wrap up in conclusion for that? Yeah, let's say that uh, we have worked on this topic since uh, three years ago, and now we have a follow up at least of for one year, one year and a half, uh, going in deep on some uh, aspects uh, like, for example, the discoverability of APIs, which is really important in government as well, because APIs are becoming a lot more and more in government environment as well. And the main issue is how to find the right API for the right application, for example. Mm. And the second issue that we will um, study and we will analyze in deep is about the security, as Monica was highlighting, was identified as a main uh, challenge for the ones that the institutions that would like to adopt uh, APIs in their organization, uh, let's say. And we are connecting this, uh, the results of the study that we are uh, doing with the, some initiative of the, within the European Commission, like the ones uh, Call the so-called, let's say, the SEF building blocks of the building blocks of interoperability of the European Commission is providing, like, for example, the e-delivery building block that, which main goal is the exchange of data set between the public and private sector and vice versa and between the, all the institutions, let's say, in the neutral way, but uh, adopting not only the web services as it was done till now, but also the APIs and some models and some architectural styles like the REST API, for example, that should be introduced in government as Mark and, and Monica were uh, presenting. Let's say this is a challenge, but we are collaborating with a lot of um, institutions and organizations, as well with the private sector. And this is one of the great results we have obtained by collaborating with the API days uh, uh, conferences and teams and with you actually, which was one of the main results as well. Since the beginning, we started learning from the private sector, how they implemented this API in their organization and what we can learn. And we also transmitted our knowledge, for example, in the, in some aspects like the transparency, the of the public administration, the dissemination of open data, how can this open data can be um, shared with the web services and the APIs. And I think that one of the main results that were also discussed during the previous presentation was that we organized together with the API days, the private sector, the companies that are working on this uh, aspect, let's say, and the public sector. So many stakeholders from the member together the workshop to discuss about the aspects and how to solve the main challenges that government should, uh, uh, I mean, should uh, deal with in the next years, especially thinking about the, the challenges that we are um, tackled with in the, in the next future, which is, they are about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, web of things, uh, uh, smart cities, intelligent cities, and so on. And we uh, highlighted the fact that actually between the availability of the, all these data sets that are now available on the web and the making of the application and the services for citizens, something was, miss, were missing, was missing, right? And this something are the APIs that, as Monica and Mark, they presented, uh, they fill the gap and let developers develop uh, more and more applications that also um, go into the direction of satisfying the need of citizens and the public services that the governments are made for them. Let's say, yeah, I mean, if you want, I can summarize, let's say, the, the study. Of course, what was presented was not all the things that we have done during these three years. It was uh, really a few times that we could present uh, uh, this, um, these results. But if you want to have uh, more uh, information, I will share a couple of uh, a couple of slides, let's say, if I may, that of course we we describe in deep all these results in the main science for policy report that is titled as this web uh, webinar, and also we collected the, the main standards about. APIs for uh, governments, and we describe in deep the framework uh, for digital government, as, as Mark was also uh, showing in a, in a technical, in two technical reports, and we have this online tool. Um, there are other, uh, let's say, uh, community engagement websites you can consult, the people can consult, 
of course the main the main uh, one of the main uh, link on how to follow us is also uh, to follow us in the api days event especially the the, the next one that will take uh, place in in few days in paris in which me and monica will present the results of the last three years of uh, our uh, research and next steps there is a um, collection, uh, a group of, uh, let's say, reports and data sets and tools and survey and events that we collect in a join up European Commission, uh, um, let's say, website. And there is also a non-European Commission official LinkedIn groups that we are maintaining with Monica and, uh, and, uh, and Mark that is, let's say, try to uh, get involved uh, many actors from the private and the public sector. And just to close the presentation, let's say that one of the, I, here we summarize the four main policy recommendations for government that you can find explained in detail in our uh, uh, final uh, report, the Science for Policy report. So what uh, we suggest is that, of course, to explicitly adopt APIs in governments, to create and improve the API culture in governments, and to use and validate, because, of course, our, our uh, right now only proposal that should be validated and defined for, for governments with the help of uh, many institutions that are active in uh, all the European Union as we found during our study. And, and the last but not least is to become digital ecosystems aware. So APIs open a big door uh, towards the other uh, institution that government should of course uh, um, use and uh, to improve uh, their, web, their public services for citizens and the society. Thank you, Lorenzino. So uh, we, 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 have a, we, have, we have some minutes uh, still to, uh, to answer all of this. Thank you for all these uh, uh, a really insightful and complete version, but I invite all the listeners actually to uh, to to read all the report, at least what they can from their, these reports, or engage directly with you, Monica, with you, Lorenzino, or with you, Mark. You know, you remember we had seven questions right at the beginning, and maybe as a as a final wrap up, we can try to answer these questions. You know, in a in a short way, but just to make a, a big a big recap, right? If you are okay with that. So the first question we had was why APIs for government, right? Can someone try to sum this up? Maybe. Yeah, and, uh, governments need to, to keep the pace with the digital transformation. And uh, the, the, for that, they need to connect to, to every actor in society. APIs uh, very often make uh, this, this, uh, this link. So yeah, I think that's uh, the, the short uh, answer to this question. Yeah, so to continue, yeah, digital transformation is mandatory. APIs are the way to do it and scale it and, 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 and onboard everybody to do it. So yeah, this is why governments need APIs. Of course, yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not the only thing. We need much more. It is like one, one basic step as is, is an enabler of, of, of this process. So yeah, if, if, it's, uh, if, if it's just the enabler, can someone try to sum up what we said about the current API government landscape? Where do we start? I think uh, if I can uh, make it, go for it. Yeah, please. There you go. Then, uh, okay, thanks, Mark. And then please uh, uh, stop me or add uh, whatever you think it's 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 current. Let's say, uh, I mean, I I can try to make a history of what we have done during our study. We started from uh, asking the stakeholders what what they I mean they would uh, need as the most in, in, important things. And they actually ask the first thing, you know, the standards of API, what is out there? How can we use these standards and who is using them? And so we started making a landscape of the API standards that are out there. And we share this in the first report with, uh, with our stakeholders, with the member states, but not only. And we asked them for feedback, okay? So we made the survey, on the API strategies in, in Europe as well to understand what which was the, the status the state of the art of the in, uh, adoption of APIs in government who were, were the governments that were implementing them okay and we made also some particular uh, case studies on seven uh, cases at regional national and uh, local level to understand the different dimensions of the use of APIs in government 
but then uh, this, of course this was not enough uh, we continue with the survey and we contacted uh, during the three years the main actors of the apis in government but also the main actors through the api days of the private sector and we learn from them actually we now we have quite a big community uh, of experts but not only uh, let's say of experts from the private sector but also from the public sector that are trying to implement this platform either in a whole government way, let's say, or in some ad hoc uh, implementation for artificial intelligence, for example. So we are completing this uh, landscape, which actually is quite, uh, is quite good right now. We have more than 200 cases that we collected all around Europe. And we have also many cases from outside Europe that we uh, collected with the help of, of Mark, for example, that was expert in some, in some fields. Maybe Mark, you want to add something or about these experiences. No, the, that's great. That's great, Monica. No, go, go ahead. Oh, and yeah. then I, I will yeah. sum up uh, with, with some ideas on how to uh, watch the landscape and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, this is great. So then that's, um, so I think Laurentino explained it really well as far as, you know, there's so much activity happening. And so it was really important to pull it all together and put it in one place. Um, we're not saying, to stop doing what you're doing, but we're just sort of saying course correct slightly as you go to be able to adopt best practices um, and shift slightly so that your work is going to be more cohesive and more joined up in future. Yeah, and building up on, on, on that, so it's true that the APIs have a very, um, um, are technical enablers, as I said before, but they are also organizational enablers. So they are, they are um, um, artifacts that allow different systems and actors to interact. So uh, these interfaces are defining who you are uh, sharing your assets with, uh, what assets you are defining and under which conditions. And this is the organizational layer that uh, APIs also have. So it's, it's very interesting, um, and that's why also we, we are analyzing um, in, in, in currently um, in in-depth um, organizational and, and legal aspects of APIs and, and the interactions between different actors. That's great because the, the fourth question is really about what are now the cultural challenges? You know, you say it's not technical, it's organizational. Yeah, can, you, can we name it? Can we name them, right, and try to point them? Well, I mean, um, so as, as um, the, 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 the governments, uh, governments have worked for a long time uh, in, in silo-based uh, um, um, structures. Um, and uh, indeed, it, this is based on, on budget allocation, on, on, uh, well, on, on, on many things. Um, legacy systems that evolve uh, very slowly um, now uh, there is a demand to to uh, to to become um, connected, to 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 become digital, fully digital, and then to to uh, rewire the connection between um, societal actors. Um, and this pushes governments to um, to to uh, to to become, um, to, to develop their, their skills, to, to, to adapt and then to look um, for ways to get, um, to get to the expectations of, of their citizens. Um, so, yeah. Um, can I I'll follow up? Oh, can I jump in there? The, um, I think you're absolutely right. It's all about the skills development and the skills that we see that are going to be necessary to break down those silos. There's going to be need to be the design thinking skills where you start from what do the users need and you sort of move more from that sort of model. And you see this is really interesting within um, governments like Singapore where they are taking a moments of life trajectory. So they're thinking more from, okay, when a child is born, then the hospital has information that should trigger the childcare department that should tr trigger education down the track, you know, early child development, uh, vaccinations, all of these things. Normally what happens is the citizen has to go to each government department and sign that up, but sw sw swapping this around so that it's more from um, how can APIs ease that process for the citizen 
and ensure that there is the health requirements, that there is the early childhood opportunities. You know, like that sw swaps it around and it's a different way. Then immediately health and education need to be talking um, in new ways. And maybe um, to get to beyond what Monica was saying, as far as the silos and the budgets, maybe there is incentives then for education and health to be working together. Maybe they only get their full budget if they can show that a citizen has only needed to contact the government once to have those two services connected. You know, rather than at the moment, it's more that you would avoid that because the education wants their budget and the healthcare wants their budget. So they have to each prove that they've got their own databases and their own services. So it's that sort of change in thinking. So we should link API yeah. management you know, KPIs yeah. right, with, with budgets, right? You have to consume each other to get the totality budget, right? Absolutely. That's where, uh, that's again, where APIs are the tail wagging the dog, you know, like this, uh, when you move to this, it then starts changing all of your uh, government processes and operations as well, if you're going to really create the value. I mean, it's design thinking, it's um, new skills in collaborating across um, mm -hmm. departments. It's, um, uh, policy people understanding technology a bit better rather than seeing it as completely separate. Um, and it's about having pe uh, departments understand interoperability a lot more. It's about having um, work, uh, public servants being, un being expert at ecosystem facilitation. Yeah, if, you know what they I would may... say? Oh, no, please, please go, Lanzino, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry for interrupting, but uh, this is, I have to say this, right, that uh, I have learned from Marco Panebianco of Regione Lombardia, the first time we met with, with him, he told us, uh, you know, e uh, APIs are interfaces without a face. And that's the main challenge, actually. We know because we are experts, we, we work in this field since uh, ma many, many years ago, or a lot of time ago, that they are very important. They are the glue, they are the connector of uh, systems, IT systems, but not only, also organizatively, as, as Monica was saying. The problem is that when you talk about budget or you talk about the allocation of this budget for the interoperability between the departments and the governments, the people, they, or the managers, they, saw, they see the, the application, right? The final, the public service, the application, or the data sets but they don't see what is in the middle. So the collector of these different things. So they allocate the budget, maybe a few budget for the interoperability for APIs, but a lot of for data sets and public services. So something is missing. So the glue that links all together these things around the government is missing. And that's what we are trying to do actually. We are trying to disseminate this knowledge and this need in government. And that's the main, one of the main reasons of our work. You know what they will say, if you save costs because actually you, you use APIs to, uh, to use shared resources, they will say they will cut our budget. So this is why we keep silos, right? So it has to be a culture also from the top down, right? Not just, a, not just from the bottom up uh, there. But yeah, APIs have this capability. No, uh, but but, but on, on, on our study, we've, we found out some examples on which uh, they are already um, co-funding uh, co funding, uh, um, development. So there are certain departments that are sharing some costs um, to, to build up uh, a shared infrastructure. So um, I think that um, what we also have observed is that the, the, the catalyzer um, effect that uh, ado the adoption of APIs bring. So uh, normally what we observe is that uh, the APIs are, are uh, start very little and uh, very small and then uh, all of a sudden there is uh, more and more uh, momentum and at, up until the moment that it explodes and there is a lot of um, I mean the, 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 the growing of the digital ecosystem uh, API enabled digital ecosystem um, it is, is very fast but you have to reach this level and um, with, with the, 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 the framework I think that we have um, um, specified and find, uh, find uh, the, the maybe maybe the points in which you can um, you can understand what what is the need what, what are the steps that you have to follow to get to that point in which you you start having um, 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 fully fledged uh, digital ecosystem to grow 
from uh, from from. So yeah. So you last two questions. You have the four P's, right? The platform, the people, the processes, the policies. Are are they? Do they all need the equal investment? Do does government need some before the others? How how would you advise a, an EPI uh, manager or at least a a, a, a poly, um, let's say a, a government EPI manager to to manage th these four investment sectors? I think one of the things uh, uh, that I've learned from Monica and Lorenzina with this project is that we can't ask government to stop doing what they're currently doing to change to what we say they should be doing. So it should be much more, um, and it comes back to that agile and iterative approach. So it's got to be something that actually recognizes they've already made that investment. They've made those decisions on which way forward. So that's why we've got the maturity toolkit, uh, the maturity checklists, so that you can, first of all, you look at what your priorities are. So maybe you've got, uh, maybe you've already identified that you're doing work in transport. So if you're doing that, then you look at, okay, maybe this year we want to fix up the governance so that there's the same sort of standards being used for all APIs. So let's look at the governance proposal. You'd answer the checklist there. And then out of that, you might say, okay, we're going to put a little bit of our budget towards um, streamlining governance because what we found was that we're missing this, this, and this. And then we look at what um, is being done globally in best practices. And we see this information management governance system from Victoria, and we're gonna try to implement the way they're doing it um, in our government. So, you know, like, so it's just this constant, so we can't, you know, like it's gotta be that constant shift rather than um, drop everything and move to this. So we've built it as like this iterative model. For that so I, I would say start with where you're at you know what your priorities are already as a government mm -hmm. um uh, and then see how this can help you become more cohesive rather than change everything that you're doing yeah there cannot be a, a disruption of of services indeed and um and the budget is what it is and um yeah it's it's uh, you you really need to do it uh, gradually but um, as we said, we have observed already um, some very nice developments, like the one in Zaragoza that uh, they they chose they choose to 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 go into an API format because actually there was not that many budgets, and um, and then they have grown a, a very interesting uh, API ecosystem on top of their of, of their uh, open data, so um, that has grown beyond. Uh, um, beyond the, the, the open data. And now it's including uh, physical infrastructure in the city, it's including um, um, uh, private sector uh, trying to, to use their data to, to once profit themselves, and, but also to improve the, the, the city mobility as a service. It's, it's really interesting, some of the examples that we have um, uh, observed. So for if companies, I may work... add something, please. Oh, no, no, please. I was asking the last question, but no, please have your comment before. No, just just uh, one second about the, the people, the figures that are important in the organization. I mean, the first time I heard about API evangelist, I said, oh, what, what are these people? I mean, and these are very important because these are the ones that will give, uh, let's say, a role of the APIs in the organization or will we'll transmit this role to the others because the role, it's there, but the problem is that to, to, to explain and to storytell about these APIs to the other, let's say, managers of a, a government of an organization, this is a very important figure that in the government that we have deal with, that we always found, we always found that there was one person or a, a group of person that were convinced of this and will manage, will push the these APIs into the government and we saw some results like the one that Monica was uh, citing and also and also Mark. Yeah, nurture the uh, your API champions, right? <laughs> this is how I would sell it. So last question, uh, where do we start? What advice would you say to someone who just want to start uh, next uh, Monday or next Tuesday, depending on when they watch the webinar? But yeah, starting or continuing an API practice, like what what, what do you recommend them to to be and to and, and to do? Well, I mean, um, Mark was was uh, was already saying you know what you what, where you are, 
And, and I think that's very interesting. So we're starting by uh, using our tool to really understand what, where are they, how they score on the maturity levels and where they could improve and at a reachable way. It's a very interesting point. You're first, you have to know where you are and then you can build up and, 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 and decide wisely where to, how, how to, get, to best uh, evolve. Hmm. That's my point. That's my take. I, I agree. The, I would also um, rewind this webinar to that point that Lorenzino showed the um, some of the links at the um, in his slide deck where he was showing, for example, there's the LinkedIn group that you can join to be part of, to start reaching out to others who are building um, APIs within governments and speak to them. You can reach out, you can have a look at the joint up um, a list of resources that Lorenzino showed and be able to start having a read and access through those. And then there's the links to the work that um, we've all been involved in um, around, you know, mapping the API landscape and then the framework. So there's some, so there's some great resources that um, have been described already. So, uh, you know, so, so that'll help you get started. Okay. Yeah, let, oh, please go. Sorry. Let's say that the, the maturity tool, the online one, in which we collected all the questions that uh, we, let's say, uh, published on the, on the report as well, gives a person, gives a, a manager or an API product manager, uh, the, a, 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 let's say, a grade on how uh, the, I mean, which, which are the areas that they should improve if they want. And this is linked to also what Monica said, how, how can they understand? Okay, they answer the question and they see where the things are missing. And this, is, and this comes from uh, what uh, Marco was saying, actually with uh, quite a, a, a big research or an extensive uh, research on the best practices all around the world. So he started, uh, we started from three, 1,900 documents, and then we selected more than 340, and then we took the diamonds, let's say, of this experience and put in the framework and the online self-assessment maturity tool. So it seems you are the four Ps, right? Uh, people, process, platform, policies, and you have the three Cs, right? The code, the, the community, right? With events, with uh, groups, with uh, uh, you know other peers, you have the the the, uh, the content, the the reports you've written. There is other. Uh, um, also, you can check on developer portals of other government, public sector, private sector to inspire, right? And there is also code, right? Just to want to add, there is a lot of open source code and tooling, right? That is available more and more to help start for free at least. Uh, before maybe uh, buying a, a bigger solution from a vendor uh, later, but at least there, there are things to, to start. I would just finish to say that how to start, you know, two main quotes, like those who don't know the past, uh, th those who don't know the, the errors of the past are condemned to repeat them, right? So it's, this is what you said, Monica, you have to know where you come from to not repeat the mistakes, but also the, on, the only way to predict the future is to invent it. So to be part of the future you want to build, right? So yeah, we, you know, there, where do we come from? Where do we go? And uh, yes, our work uh, tried to, to, uh, uh, to make the link between, uh, between the two. Uh, just maybe last round, really last round, where can we know more about you or your work today? Yeah, I think that um, Lorenzino, I mean, if you can, if Lorenzino can share that slide that uh, Mark was also referring to, that will be the, the place to, to go. There you can find our reports, our surveys, our, all the data that we have published, all, all, all the material, and also through LinkedIn uh, group uh, that we have created and we are maintaining um, for, for uh, sharing some of the news and um, and the, the advances of our research as well. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Lorenzino. Uh, I hope for all listeners it was insightful. Uh, you will receive all uh, the links and everything. Thanks, you, Lorenzino, for sharing the slide. But we will send a wrap up to everybody with all the links, insightful links, for you to be able to uh, um, to know more. And we'll send you a list of events where you can uh, when you can go. Uh, right to continue the discussion. Thank you for all of us. Thank to have you. Been here. Thanks, and everyone. Yes.
Have a wonderful day. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.